Well, good morning, church. My name is Derek. Um, ZF graciously let me intern here a couple years ago for about six months. Thank you so much for your kindness and letting me do that and for welcoming Lacey and I into your midst. Uh, Before I did that, uh, Lacey and I spent seven years in Asia. We were evangelizing an unreached language group. We were trying to persuade them to leave Islam and to worship Jesus. And then we and everyone else doing that had to leave. Since then, I've been working full-time for our missions agency, uh, Pioneers. My job is to help churches send people with the gospel to places where the gospel cannot be heard yet. Also, I do like to teach God's word whenever I can. So let me pray, and we'll get started. Father, teach us from your word. Show us your glory in the face of Christ. Empower us by your spirit to tell others about Jesus. Amen. Uh, So we've been doing a series about evangelism, and I figured I could define that word, but I I figured it might be better if I just evangelized you. So I'm going to do that. You ready? God made you, and God made everything else. He, He made us all to worship him as our loving king. The Bible says this, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power because you created all things. What do you think about that? That's a good response. Didn't hear any disagreement yet, although I I hope there is some in here. Um, There's a problem, though. We choose to live life our own way without God. We, We do what we want, We don't really treat God like he's really God. God says this about us. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And think to yourself, what are are some examples of us living our own way? The problem is God won't let us rebel against him forever. He's good, so he punishes evil. And the penalty for our evil is death and judgment. God says it is appointed for man to die once and after that to face judgment. Should God punish evil? Now, here's the good news. God sent Jesus to die for us. Scripture says, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. God loves people and God punishes sin. And Jesus, unlike us, obeyed God. Then he took the punishment we deserve. What do you think about Jesus dying as a substitute for sinners? And that's not all. God raised Jesus back to life, physically, literally, in history. Jesus right now rules everything. Jesus gives forgiveness and new life right now. And Jesus will return at some point to judge the world. The Bible says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth to a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Do you think Jesus is really alive? That he could be? So leaves us with two ways to live. We can continue to live life naturally. That means we continue to not treat God like God. It might mean we're not Hitler, but we're not treating God like he's God. Live like we want to, which might be good sometimes. But that means also facing death and judgment. Or we can choose to live life God's new way. And that means swearing allegiance to Jesus. It means relying on his death alone for forgiveness. Everyone who does this is is actually forgiven by God. They all will live forever with Jesus. God says this, whoever believes the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. 
So there are only two kinds of people. There's normal people, and there's people who accept God's new way. How does somebody move from living humanity's way to living God's new way? That's by welcoming Jesus as ruler. It's asking him to forgive your sins and to give you eternal life. Now listen, which way describes you? If you want to live God's way and you haven't been, you can. You can right now. You can ask Jesus to forgive you and to give you new life. Tell him you want to live submitting to him. If you do that, Jesus has forgiven your sins and you have eternal life. Praise be to God. Now, what I just did right there is evangelism. It's telling people that Jesus died for sins, that he is alive, that he's reigning, and that he's returning. And that's what this series is about. It's about evangelism. And by the way, I haven't started the sermon yet officially. Um, But I'm going to give you something to do. ZF has this booklet that I just used at the Resource Center. It's called Two Ways to Live. If you can read this, you do not need glasses. You can take one for free if you commit to memorizing the scriptures in it in the next month. Or if you will give it to somebody who doesn't know Jesus this week. Or, and listen to this, if you are right now living life your own way and want to learn about living life God's new way. If that's you, please go take one after worship. Now, let me tell you a little bit about my history with evangelism. I I grew up in church. Every week, the, the pastor evangelized at the end of the service. But I was also taught that if I was basically nice enough, then people would ask me why I was so great. That has literally never happened to me. Now, there's two problems with it. One is that I'm not that awesome. And, and probably, despite what your mom says, you're not either. <laughs> Second, Mormons are nicer than us. And, and they believe their God is an alien who's going to give them their own planet. And, and that's false, by the way. Regardless, I believed that I had to, like, nice people into Jesus. When I started college, I got involved in a campus ministry, because that's where the Christian girls were. A staff guy named Kirk started meeting with me for discipleship. One day he called me, and he told me, hey, there's a guy I'm going to go meet with in your dorm. You want to come? So I said, sure. So we showed up at the guy's room. We had some small talk. We sat down, and suddenly I noticed, hey, wait, there's half-naked women on the walls, and there's tons of cheap beer everywhere. And I thought, wait a minute, this guy's not a Christian, because Christians don't drink cheap beer, (laughs) but also the half-naked women. Anyway, I thought, this guy's not a Christian, why why are we here? And, And the next thing I know, Kirk is asking this guy about his religious background, and then he asks him, what do you, what do you think will happen to you after you die? And then he asked can I tell you what the Bible says about this stuff? Right? Can I tell you what the Bible says about this stuff? And the guy, to my surprise, said, sure. And then Kirk explained who Jesus is, why he died, why he rose, and how we can receive eternal life. And I, at first, was panicking. I was thinking to myself, you cannot do this. You just met this guy But then afterwards, I was floored. I realized this was actually a real conversation. This student actually heard and understood who Jesus is. So when we got back downstairs, I turned to Kirk and I said, teach me. I graduated from college and went right on staff with that campus ministry. Evangelism was my job for 10 years on college campuses. Then evangelism was my job for seven years in Asia. And you know what? Evangelism is still hard for me. It's still uncomfortable. It includes confrontation and disagreement and tension and awkwardness, and I don't like that. 
And so I need your help to be motivated to tell the gospel. And you probably need the help of others as well. It's uncomfortable. We'd rather talk about other stuff. We'd rather even maybe argue about other stuff. But it's hard to talk with people about Jesus. And that's why we're going to be looking at two words this morning from Ephesians 5.11. It's on page 978, I believe, in the Bibles under the chair. So if you don't have a Bible, take that, please. It's page 978, I think. If I'm not correct, somebody can shout it out. It's fine. Here's the two words. Listen to God's word. Expose them. Expose them. That's the point of the message today. Expose them. And that that probably raises questions. It should. And we'll address those questions in a minute. But first, here's the context. Ephesians 5, 11 to 16 says this. Listen to God's word. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Therefore, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. It's God's word. Here's my outline this morning. I'll be answering four questions. First, who must expose them? All right? Who's got to do this? Second, who gets exposed? Who or what gets exposed? Third, what's expose them mean? All right, what's expose them mean? And four, how? Yeah, literally just how. It's just one word. So if you're taking notes, really quick, how? All right, here's our first question. Who must expose them? Who must expose them? Well, verse 14, those who are awake, who have risen from the dead, those on whom Christ Jesus has shined light. Verse 8, those who were once darkness but are now light in the Lord, who are subjects of the King, the Lord Jesus. Who must expose them? Well, everyone who knows the Lord Jesus. Has Christ woken you up? Well, you must expose them. How else are the people of of light described here? 432 says it's the people that God's forgiven for all their sins. 51 says they're God's children. 52, it's the people that Christ died for and made his beloved. 53, it's the saints, it's God's special people. 55, it's citizens of God's kingdom. 56, it's those who are saved from the wrath of God against the insubordinate. So it's we who are for forgiven sinners, who are loved by God, who are died for by Jesus, who love his word, who know Jesus. We have orders from our king. Expose them. Expose them. Now, I, I realize I haven't said what that means yet, and we'll get there. I mean, spoiler alert, it's evangelism. That's what the series is about. But if Christ has given you new life, you will do this. You will obey your Redeemer. But it's, it's hard. And so before we move on to our second question, let me give you one thing that might help you. Ready? Discipline yourself to constantly be giving thanks to God. Verse 4 says, let there be thanksgiving. Now it doesn't say thankfulness. Thanksgiving is actually saying thank you, like with words. Well, in, in context, thanking God for what? Well, for, for, for the stuff we just talked about. God saved you from his wrath by pouring his wrath out on Jesus instead. He's forgiven you. He's loved you. He's made you a saint. We, we literally have eternity to give thanks for. We have Christ shining on us. So let's make this a habit. Let's discipline ourselves daily to give thanks for what Christ has done for us. If we don't feel joy, we should actually confess that to God and and then give thanks anyway. Listen, if you need help with this, ask somebody for help. Let our conversations be full of giving thanks to God for Christ. Yeah, for unimportant things like a meal or health or whatever, but more 
for God's kingdom. I was talking to, um, well, I have a friend that just died a few months ago. And I was talking to her, her dad. And as I was talking to her dad, he simply gave thanks that God had saved her and that she is with Jesus, her Lord, right now. Let's give thanks like that. Sometimes if I'm having trouble with joy or giving thanks, I'll just ask somebody, ask a Christian, to, to tell me something from the Word. Like, hey, could you help me? I need a reminder about Jesus. Once I was helping a Muslim learn English, um, and he, he found out that I had chronic back pain, and he asked me about it, and I told him it really hurt and it stinks, but I knew Jesus was going to give me a new back. That sparked more conversation, as you can imagine. But that Muslim man was exposed to Jesus. Why? Simply because of giving thanks. So, you who are light in Christ, listen. Let's help each other give thanks. Let's fill our speech with praising God. If our speech is full of Christ, guess what will happen? Well, people are going to hear it. They'll be exposed to Jesus. Anyway, our, our first question was this. Who exposes them? Who needs to do this? That's every Christian. All right, that was the first question. Second question, who or what is them? And, and expose them, who or what is the them? Well, verse 11, it's those in darkness. Verse 12, it's those who do the deeds of darkness. Verse 13, it's those who don't have the light. Verse 14, it's those who are asleep, who are dead, who do not know Christ. It's those who are not forgiven, who are under God's judgment and God's wrath. Now, remember two ways to live? Some of you already forgot. Two ways to live. There's only two ways. There's people who submit to Jesus, and there's people that live their own way. Do you believe that? There are only two kinds of people. There's only two destinies. That's it. It, it might not feel that way, and it might not feel like not submitting to God isn't that bad. But look, if God is really God, then acting like he isn't is the worst thing that a human could do. Not submitting to God isn't neutral. It's not innocent. It is the greatest evil. It is the worst betrayal. It is the most foul treason that is possible in the universe. Verse 12 says that the things done as if God didn't notice those things— they're even shameful to mention in conversation. Every human being, all of us, are conceived as rebels against God. We by nature ignore God's commands and live as if we're our own gods. We're all born that way. That's who we are. That's what we want. That's what we do. But if you are in Christ, listen to what God says about you. At one time you were darkness, but now... You are light in the Lord. Expose them. Expose them. So, well, who's the them? It's, it's every normal, natural person. It's everyone who doesn't live in subjection to God's new way. Expose them. Now, here's another practical tip for you. All right, you ready? Here it is. Stop talking. Wait, how's that work? That doesn't make any sense. Let, let me be more specific. Stop talking uselessly. We, we just talked about the usefulness of giving thanks, right? Well, what's the opposite of that? It's in verse 4, it says this, Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. Now, when he says Filthiness, foolish talk, or crude joking, he is not talking about poop jokes. In fact, there are arguably a handful of poop jokes in the Bible. I know this because I have them memorized. <laughs> what, what Paul is saying here is don't glorify stuff other than God. Don't, don't draw people's attention to things other than God. Don't 
get people to want stuff other than God. The reason he says not to is in verse 5. Verse 5 says this, Because you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So don't draw people's desires to stuff other than God. But we do that all the time, don't we? It's so easy. Oh, you've got to watch this show. You've got to try this restaurant. You've got to see my pictures. You've got to try this vacation spot. You've got to hear this news. Now, okay, suggestions about nice things aren't sin. But are, are we talking more about the world, excited about that, or more about Jesus, excited about him? Are we drawing people's attention to desire stuff? Or are we drawing people's attention to desire God? If you're like me, you probably need to confess that a lot of times it's the former. Actually, if you're able, will you stand with me? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray. Let me pray. Uh, Fa- Father in heaven... Forgive us for loving stuff more than you. Forgive us for distracting people from you. Cause us to give thanks to Jesus as a habit. Thank you for forgiveness. And it's because Jesus died for us that we can pray and and thank you for forgiveness. Amen. All right, you can grab a seat. Just because I prayed doesn't mean the sermon is over. (laughs) I'm allowed to do that in the middle of a sermon. That's okay. Anyway, let's, let's stop talking uselessly in general. That that is natural, but living in light of reality means talking for the glory of God. Won't that be awkward? Yeah, probably. And? God commands us. Expose them. All right, so our second question is, who's the them? That's people who don't know Jesus. Expose them. All right, third question. What does expose them mean? All right, what does expose them mean? Well, it means evangelism. It means telling people about sin and the Savior. It means doing what I did at the beginning with two ways to live. Now, okay, how do we know it means that? Well, the context is pretty clear. Verse 13 says, when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. Verse 14, because anything that becomes visible is light. And in this passage, there are two kinds of people. There's light and there's darkness. There's children of God and there's children of wrath. There's people in God's kingdom and people out of it. And the the aim of exposing people is to make them light. Additionally, God gives us an example of exposing in words in this text. It's verse 14. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Exposing people is is telling them, wake up, leave the dead, and receive Christ's light. If they do, God will make them light. He will make them God's very children. Now, exposing people has two parts. One is confrontation, because we do live life our own way. We do live in sin. And it's not necessarily obvious sin. Verse 5 both lists sexual immorality of all kinds and covetousness. But it's all darkness. That's one part of exposing them. But the other part of exposing them is is telling them about Jesus. It's telling them about eternal life. Christ will shine on you. And that's what expose them means. It means evangelize. Tell people about our guilt and God's forgiveness. About our rebellion and Christ's redemption about us as traitors, but Jesus as our death penalty. That's what expose them means. Now, let me, let me read to you a few other places where uh, the term expose them is used. Now, that term is almost always translated either convict or rebuke or reprove. So as you're hearing these, you're not going to hear the word expose, but it's the same underlying term. Here we go. God says this about a church service. If an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. God commands pastors, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. 
God recounts an example of evangelism in Jude. Behold, the Lord comes to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly. Jesus himself says this, those whom I love, I reprove. So what does expose them mean? In the context of Ephesians chapter 5, it means evangelism. It's a simple message. We've rebelled. Christ redeems. Repent. Receive forgiveness. That's what expose them means. Some of us might object. It, it maybe sounds harsh or not nice. Well, it, it is confrontation. That's why it's hard to do it. We like being nice. We don't want to hurt people's feelings. We don't want to mess this up. And, and there's some good impulses there. You should not be an arrogant jerk. Some of you should write that down. I'm just kidding. Um, you, you, really shouldn't, you really shouldn't be argumentative. Um, God, God tells us to love. He tells us to be kind. He tells us to make our speech gracious. And some of us need to hear that. For, for some of us, it's easy to get in disagreements about things other than Jesus. It's like we'd rather get into a tense conversation trying to get somebody to vote more like us than to not go to hell. It sounds really bad when I say it out loud, doesn't it? But it is tempting. And we need to actually choose to obey the command that God has given to us. Expose them. Talk about sin and the Savior. And, and you know what? A lot of people will not like that. In most of world history and in most of the world right now, it gets Christians killed. Just like Peter was and like Paul was and like Jesus was and like Stephen was and like Antipas was and like Polycarp was. They weren't killed because they were nice. They also weren't killed because they were jerks. They were killed because they wouldn't shut up about Jesus risen from the dead. Speaking about our rebellion and God's redemption will make some people angry. And also, it's going to make some people Christians. It's going to make some people alive. It's going to make some people actually receive mercy and love from God. It's going to make some people worship the one true living God. So, let's expose them. Now, some of you might be saying, okay, I get, I get it, I get it, I'm obligated to expose them. Okay, how do I do it? Well, here's one idea. Maybe just sit down by yourself or with some other people and brainstorm some ways. And, and then try them. Now guess what? All of your ideas are all going to be awkward. This whole thing is awkward. I don't like it. But God says to do it. And as we obey, we will find that we are bonded, united to Christ that we're united to his spirit, that we are in the presence of God because we will be walking in the spirit, doing what the spirit does in the world, which is proclaiming Christ. So let's resolve to act. Let's resolve to think. I mean, honestly, why not, like, right now, decide a time, maybe even today, unless you're doing something better on the Lord's Day, but maybe today, to just sit down for five minutes and brainstorm, okay, what are some ways that I can do this? Here's another really practical way to expose people. Ask for permission. Just ask for permission. Listen to this. Can I explain the message of the Bible to you? Can I explain the message of the Bible to you? See? Not that hard. A little weird, but not that hard. What's expose them mean? Well, it means evangelize. It means tell them about sin and salvation. It means... Tell them about Jesus, the Lord God. That's what expose them means. Fourth question, how? How? Answer to that question, on purpose. All right? It's on purpose. It's not by accident. Verses 15 and 16 say this. 
Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Did you hear the then or the therefore? Look carefully, therefore, how you live. Well, well why? Well, because, peop- because Jesus is saving people by us exposing them. So therefore, let's be smart. Let's use God's time well. The, the time we live in is actually evil. It's evil because Adam rebelled against God, and so do all of his kids. That's all of us. The world went dark a long, long time ago. But Christ's light is piercing into the darkness right now. And how is that happening? Through talking. Through talking about Jesus. So, and this is hard, but we need to structure our lives not around getting by or having fun or making money or anything, except for God's priorities. Yes, we do need to take time to rest in the context of looking carefully how we live. We do need to fit in recreation in the context of using God's time for God's pleasure. But overall, will we resolve to use God's time to expose them or to entertain ourselves? To evangelize or to eat, drink, and be merry? Okay, let's get practical. I realize I've already given you about four suggestions, but I'm about to rattle off a bunch. My, my, my point is to not have you write all these down. My point is for you to maybe consider one or two and, and maybe choose one or two that'll help you personally to do this, all right? All right, first, do what this verse says and look carefully how you want. Examine your time through the lens of God's priorities, his word. Use a calendar if that helps. Second, be around darkness. All right, be around darkness. For for some of you, this is easy because you're at work all day or you're with small children and they're obviously evil. (laughs) Um, For for some of us, it's it's hard because we work in churches or or in ministries like myself, and so we have to actually plan it. And, And by the way, side note, and I'm not being paid to say this, because of that, don't be a pain to your elders. Part of their role is modeling evangelism, and when church members are, are whiny about things that aren't in the Bible and aren't that important, it saps them from doing the things that they need to be doing. I am not getting paid to say that, by the way. Um, third, pray for people. Now, personally, I forget that. I'm not great at just bursting out into prayer all the time. So I actually set alarms on my phone. If I'm going somewhere, if I'm going to be with people, like say, hey, pray for the salvation of this person before I meet with them. Maybe something like that would help you. Fourth, don't just hang out. Have fellowship. Fellowship in the Bible means partnership. It means working together. Hebrews 10 tells us to plan how to stir each other up towards love and good deeds. So let's do that. Fifth, brainstorm and memorize some questions like this. Do you, do you have a spiritual background? Do you believe God exists? Why, why not? Do you believe right and wrong exist? Why do you think there are only two genders? I mean, I, I agree with that, but why do you believe it? Why do you think there aren't? What do you think of Jesus? Again, can I, can I tell you the message of the Bible? Sixth, have one of your pastors come have lunch with you at work. Or have them come teach something specific at your house. Maybe invite your neighbors, say like, Eric, can you come and teach a Q&A on the problem of suffering for me and some neighbors I'm going to have over and, and just do a Q&A for, for an hour? Eric did not know I was going to throw him under the bus there, by the way. <laughs> But he would love to do it, I think. Seventh, talk about Jesus. Look, look, you talk about what you're excited about. Work, your lawn, food, grandkids. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. 
Look full on his wonderful face, and I promise you, you will talk about him. Eighth, ask others to pray with you for specific people. Like, pray with you, not then and there. Not giving prayer requests. Say, hey, can we pray for this person, like right now? Ninth, ask people to read the Bible with you. Ask this, would you want to read the Bible with me? Don't ask it like that. Would you want to read the Bible with me? That is literally what I did for seven years in Asia with people. Tenth, join something. Join a gym, join a sport, join the PTA, join a charity, join your HOA. Join something that you're not just joining for fun, but to evangelize. It it helps if it's fun, too. You don't have to be miserable, but, you know. Join something to evangelize. Eleventh, teach your kids the law and the gospel. Twelfth, singles. Don't date anyone who isn't making it their aim to evangelize. Listen, if somebody doesn't really care about the salvation of the people around them, they're not going to really care about the salvation of their own kids. Thirteenth, invite people to church. Recent research shows that 82% of unchurched people would go to church with trusted friends if invited. That's crazy, 82%? Wow. Fourteenth, and last, everybody breathed a sigh of relief. Fourteenth, use Google. Okay, I was Googling that research, I was looking for it, the first thing that popped up was 52 ways to invite somebody to church. (laughs) Now, okay, admittedly, and remember I started this saying, I need your help as well. None of this is easy. None of this is natural. We, We need to have a mindset shift, and we need to be constantly remembering the truth. Do we believe in eternity? Do we believe God should be glorified? And we also need a habit shift. We can't do that in a sermon. So, we've got some homework to do. What are you going to do? For some of you, this sermon has been really odd because you don't actually know Jesus. And so for you, there's, there's one thing to do. Wake up, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. See him, trust him, love him, obey him, and then thank him for rescuing you. For all of us, it means obeying the command that we've been looking at. Expose them. How? On purpose. In a few minutes, the service is going to end. Maybe one thing that would be helpful to talk about with somebody after the service is what's one thing that you've heard this morning that you're going to do as a result of what we've looked at in the Word? What's one thing that you're going to do? Or maybe you could, you could come up with your own thing. But Listen. You who are light in the Lord. You who once were darkness, but who are now light. Who were dead in trespasses and sins, but whom God in his great mercy made alive together with Jesus Christ. We've been given orders. Expose them. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for making heirs of wrath into heirs of your kingdom. Thank you that Jesus died for our guilt. Cause us to expose them. Father, rescue sinners. And then you will be thanked and you will be glorified and you will be delighted in. And that's what we long for. And it's because of Jesus, our Savior, our King, that we pray. Amen.